Appreciate you coming. This microphone's on, I see. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for us to be here. And what we're planning on talking about today is a little bit about our organization, which is called American Sportfish. Um, both, as uh, Mr. Cox mentioned, both Don and I worked for a state agency for a number of years and, and then ventured out into, into the private sector. So uh, I've got a background uh, in both uh, state governmental agencies and uh, also in the private sector here. And one of the things that we wanted to do uh, from the, from the get-go in our organization is try to be on the cutting edge of research and try to be on the cutting edge of developing new things. And one of the things that we developed, uh, and this, this wasn't really uh, an, an original thought, but it's something that we looked at over the years. We had a, we had a number of clients who had um, lakes that contained fish that uh, they were getting ready to drain because they couldn't catch any bass. And when we first started our hatchery in 1986, uh, we were a big proponent of stocking Florida bass. And it didn't take us very long to figure out that in some of these bigger lakes where, uh, where Florida bass had been stocked for a while, that uh, the catch rate on these get, got very low. In fact, in, in, in a number of cases, the owners of these lakes were getting ready to drain these because they thought they didn't have any bass in there. And then, uh, very similar to what Bobby and his crew do here, we brought our shocking boat, our electric fishing boat in there and shocked this thing into their dismay. We turned up very large numbers of, of big Florida bass. And the people just couldn't catch them. And so we got to talking about what we were doing in this program. And, and if we were stocking a fish that could get to be eight to 10 or 12 pounds in size and our clients couldn't catch them, uh, what good was that? So we wanted to work on something that would have excellent growth rate, the same type of potential as a Florida would, but be much more aggressive in something that our clients uh, could stock and catch with artificial lures. So we developed uh, what is, is known as, as an F1, but our fish we call a, a tiger bass, and it's different from an ordinary F1 in the fact that we've selected strains of bass we have a number of um, bass that, uh, Florida bass, for instance, that have come from trophy fish. And uh, we've developed a strain of northern bass that are very aggressive, and we combine these two together. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to give you a little short presentation on uh, what is a tiger bass and how we developed that, and uh, talk a little bit about bass genetics, some of the things that Bobby and his crew are doing up here in Chickamauga and other lakes. And, uh, and show you where we're coming from. And then at the end of this presentation, we'll be glad to take any questions. Let me find my little presentation here so I'll make sure I don't go ahead and give you repeat bobbies. So we're, um, <clears throat> my partner Don Keller sitting on the back row back there. We started this group, American Sport Fish, in 1986. You know, one of the things that people talk about is, uh, is genetics. You know, this is a picture of a fish that came from California. Uh, this would have been a new world record largemouth bass. Can you help me with that? Just hit make it a little bit better. Very good. Thank you so much. So, you know, if you're, if you're a real scientist, you might look at this thing and say, well, is, is this 100% Florida bass or is this a cross between a Florida and a native? And, and of course, for most of us that are bass fishermen, you know, who cares what the cross is? If we get something like this, this is exactly what we're, what we're kind of interested in. So I want to talk a little bit about genetics since we brought that up. And, uh, and there, there are a number of things that, uh, that you'll hear. You know, if, uh, fairly typical, and, and you people who are members of the commission here know that you can go to any barber shop and find an expert on deer or fish. And so you hear all kinds of things about, uh, about genetics. And uh, inbreeding depression is kind of something that some people throw out sometimes. And, uh, you know, a number of years ago, they made a movie about 
inbreeding depression in one of your neighboring states there. Many of you have probably seen this thing start Burt Reynolds. <laughs> you know, there's a, in breeding depression, there's a greater chance of expressing recessive or bad genes or alleles. And so you want to try to avoid that if you can. And then there's terms like outbreeding enhancement. And most of you are familiar with that. They use this in almost all any kind of uh, animals that are raised, uh, cattle, hogs, anything else. And, and we all know that, that when you have this outbreeding enhancement, it produces hybrid vigor. And that's one of the things that we find in, uh, in, in our fish is that, is that this cross between these two particular strains of bass produces an F1 that outperforms either of the parents. And, and outbreeding enhancement also masks any kind of bad alleles that may be in, in the broodstock there. And then you get things called outbreeding depression. Now this is sometimes kind of confusing and, and occasionally you'll hear somebody talk about an F1 that could possibly have outbreeding depression. But this is, uh, uh, this is actually crossing two strains of the same species that have very divergent backgrounds. For instance, if you took a, a largemouth bass from the state of New York and you brought that down and crossed that with a native bass from Tennessee or from Florida, then you might have some genes in there that were adapted over a period of years that, uh, that, that would, would not be suitable for either habitat. So the offspring may not be fit for your particular environment if you bring something else in that, that's, that has a long history of being in a different environment than what you have. And it's, uh, this type of outbreeding depression is not likely to occur through uh, very similar strains. So genetics are, in our opinion, are very important in the influence of bass populations. You know, they influence growth rates. It's, uh, it's pretty clear over a number of years that uh, biologists like Bobby and myself and my partner Don have seen in a number of states that, uh, that growth rates are affected by genetics. And one of the things that, uh, that's also affected by that is longevity. For instance, if you can get any type of Florida alleles in your population, like you've done here in Chickamauga, you'll find that uh, the growth rate of these fish increases and the longevity increases. And then there's some other things that are connected genetically, and, and those are aggressiveness or catchability. And that's one of the things that we provide in, the, in our tiger bass is the fact that, that uh, one half of this cross is a very, very aggressive fish. And, and that aggressiveness is inheritable. And so once we breed these with, with another fish, then we end up getting uh, offspring that are very aggressive. And, uh, and actually, this, uh, there's been some interesting studies done on this, uh, research-wise. And, and they all show that if you breed fish that are difficult to catch, you end up with offspring that are difficult to catch. If you breed fish that are easy to catch, the offspring are also easy to catch. So that's a genetically related trait. And then also maximum growth. And that's a lot of things that uh, a lot of state agencies are looking at uh, that have reservoirs where you sell them catch a fish over five or six pounds. They want to try to increase that potential for the anglers to go out and catch something bigger, maybe not 24 pounds, but certainly increase the chances of, of catching a big fish. And another thing that is, is genetically linked is cold tolerance. And uh, there's been a number of studies done on Florida bass that indicate that uh, Florida bass are not very cold tolerant. So they're not suitable for every reservoir in the United States. In fact, there are probably some reservoirs in, this, in the state of Tennessee where they're not very suitable. I'm not going to say that uh, because I don't have that data, but Bobby does. And uh, one of the things that's been shown through research is when that temperature gets down below 40 degrees, say around 38, is that you significantly increase the mortality rate in uh, Florida bass. And so actually in, uh, in research studies, they've shown that mortality rates of up to 50% can be experienced at only 38 degrees. So that's pretty significant. And if you're stocking Florida bass into reservoirs, 
Uh, if they make it through the first year where they can breed with your with your native bass, you get that Florida influence in there. You get you get an F1 cross, not exactly the same as what we produce, but those original Florida bass, if that reservoir is very cold, uh, certainly will die out at a pretty rapid rate. So this F1 is, uh, or tiger bass, is kind of a hybridization. And it's a very fast growing, uh, long living fish that, uh, that gets to, to large sizes and, and pretty easy to catch. So, you know, there's, uh, you get this a lot of time between similar species like blue channel crosses, for instance, and catfish uh, grow very fast, and, and they are much more rapid than either of the either of the parents. And we we see uh, this fast growth and hybrid vigor in in our F1 tiger bass. Now, creating the tiger bass is something a little different than most people think. Uh, what we have at our hatchery is a genetically pure strains of Florida bass, and, and these fish that we have as brooders were selected off of proven trophies. Now, this isn't something original. Uh, you know, over the years, you've seen this in a number of uh, hatchery facilities, for instance. Everybody's trying to select the faster growing ones to use as brood stock. In Texas, for instance, is that a program called Save a Lunker Program for a number of years where they have actually uh, borrowed uh, fish caught from their public reservoirs like like Lake Worth, for instance. Any fish over 13 pounds, uh, they come in and pick those fish up, they uh, tag them, they use them in a breeding program in their hatchery, and then re return those original fish back to the reservoir. So this is just, a, just the same thing as, as you see in a lot of other type of production where you're trying to use uh, you know, you wouldn't start a basketball team with two parents that are my size. You know, I just have to tell you that I would never make the NBA. Uh, you know, and so what we have and what we try to do with our fish is that, is that we go to the trouble of, of pit tagging these. And all y'all probably know what a pit tag is. You can put this in the ear of your dog. It's, a, it's, a, it's got 16 characters in that tag, and, it, and it's not an active transmitter, but... You, you, you run a magnetic, uh, you, you run a magnetized uh, thing over this and it excites that tag and, and, then, it, and then it exhibits that, uh, that code. So our fish are all individually tagged and we know what sex they are, and we know what strain they are, and we know what age they are. And we keep these two strains separate at our hatchery so there's no mixing. And you know, you run into a lot of people that have got fish that have both Florida and and northern alleles in there, but they're all just combined together. They're just, they're just. Uh, we we wanted to go to the extra trouble of um, keeping these strains apart and uh, going the extra trouble of, of tagging these things so that we know which individual we had. And we also do uh, controlled spawning of these. We select the pairs usually a, f a Florida bass female and a northern male, and we bring these in the laboratory, and we spawn these under control conditions. This is not something that's unique to our uh, particular facility, but we're probably one of the few private facilities that do that. And then growth rates is one of the things that everyone is interested in, including ourselves, and uh, have some pretty interesting data. You know, the basic research when everyone was looking at Florida bass back in the 1970s showed it, that uh, northern bass typically exhibited very good growth up to about age two, sometimes even faster than Florida bass. But the Florida bass, uh, you know, showed that after age two, the growth was much more significant, that not only did they grow faster and reach larger sizes, but they lived longer. And then the, our tiger bass, or F1s, in, uh, in managed private lakes where we've got a lot of food, you know, we've seen some really fast growth rate. Uh, I worked with a state agency back in 1970, and uh, we started a program of, uh, of crossing these Florida bass and comparing pure Florida bass and the cross and northern bass in a number of private ponds. And we had, a, had an F1 that uh, reached seven and a half pounds in 27 months. We thought that was phenomenal. Uh, today, that's not unusual for what we see throughout the southeast from Texas to North Florida. Uh, we see uh, these F1s growing at, at very fast rates, sometimes in excess of three pounds a year. 
So in 2008, we documented a six pound fish that was 21 months old. In 2011, and we ended up stocking the lake with two inch fingerlings. And six months from the time we stocked that, we had fish that weighed two and a half pounds. So that's pretty phenomenal growth rate. And, uh, and also in 2011, we had a 14 and a half that was only six, to six years old. So you get that potential in these and it's pretty tremendous. And you know, all of us uh, in the Southeast and my association with state agencies have, have followed the success of the Florida Bass Fingerling introductions and we developed some new state records throughout the Southeast. And uh, you know, what we've found in, in a lot of states uh, from Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama even, and, uh, and Texas is that if you look at the large bass that are taken to the taxidermist and you go in there like we did 10 years ago and pulled a liver sample out of these things to run the tissue, we found that, that these lunkers all contain Florida genetics. I mean, that was the key to developing these big fish. And in California, of course, they, they've had a number of bass out there in some of their lakes that have been over 20 pounds and some up very close to the record, like the first one I showed you here, which was actually a 25 pound fish, which would have been a world record, except that the guy snagged it in the side of the head. So it was disqualified from being a record out there. Actually, that's illegal to do that. It was an accident, but illegal to do that in California. So it, it couldn't be entered as a world record. But in, in recent years, in the last three or four years, we've had uh, fish from Japan that were actually uh, tied the world record out there. And uh, I'm not gonna say that it was our fish, but we did ship Florida bass to Japan a number of years ago from our facility. Anyway, uh, you know, genetic analysis of top bass and fishing reservoirs indicate that, uh, that all these bass, all these reservoirs that are good bass fishing reservoirs typically will have Florida bass alleles. You take Gunnersville Reservoir in Alabama, for instance, the overall uh, genetic composition of that particular lake there shows that we've got 30% Florida bass alleles in that largemouth bass populations. But the bigger fish in there have a much higher percentage, up to 50% of those show Florida bass alleles. And longevity, you know, as we mentioned earlier, is one of the things that we, is that we like. So, you know, you the longer your fish live, it's kind of like deer management, if, if those fish get above three or get to four or five years old, then, uh, then they get bigger and they get better antler development. Aggressiveness and catchability is something that, uh, that we all like to look at. Like we said originally, it's, it's no good to, to grow a bass that's 10 pounds if, it's not a, if you can't catch it on, a, on an artificial lure. And there's a lot of research that's been done on these. I mean, it's a terrible job to have to go out and fish a number of ponds with a rod and reel and keep track of what you catch and how many, how often you catch that fish. So in, in all of these, the native or northern alleles are, are the most aggressive. And the Florida bass, especially the pure Florida bass, are definitely the most difficult to catch on artificial lures. And aggressiveness, as we mentioned earlier, is an inheritable uh, characteristic. So if you've got a fish that has these aggressive or uh, genes and you mate those with one that doesn't, you end up with offspring that's much more aggressive. So growth rates and aggressiveness, you know, are something that we're looking at and, uh, and that we've uh, proven over the years in, in our particular tiger bass or, or this particular strain of F1s we've got. So Texas showed this in a number of years and, and we have two at our hatchery. So we select our bass for aggressive feeding behaviors and. We're past 15 generations now, and when we select our Florida bass, similar to what uh, Texas has done by selecting these, not just from a pure Florida, but from fish that, that have shown the ability to grow to very large sizes. So, you know, in, uh, in concluding here, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that we're all interested in is improved growth and maximum size of largemouth bass. That's the same thing all year your anglers and all your board members at fish are looking for and the same thing that Bobby Wilson's looking for. So we think that this can be accomplished uh, by introducing these F1s in the reservoirs, especially those that are out of the prime growth range for largemouth bass. So we usually view that as somewhere in southern Tennessee. 
And uh, you know, we you see some advantages in stocking tiger bass because they're they're uh, they're cold tolerant. The original fish you put in will also show very rapid growth and live for a much longer time. Instead of putting in a Florida and some of these things that, that have very cold winters where you may experience significant mortality among those. And then of course in the long term, you get to introduce not only uh, this growth rate gene from, from the Florida part of this thing, but also the aggressive gene that's associated with the tiger bass. And I didn't mean to show you this. This is a new prototype of a fish we're developing now. We're still in the stages of trying to control the aggressive behavior on this thing, but we'll, we'll get it pretty time, sometime soon. Anyway, that's uh, basically what we do here at our facility and, and a little, little background on genetics and a little bit on, uh, on our particular fish that's, uh, that we call a tiger bass, which is a selected strain of F1. So we'll, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to entertain those at this time. Have any questions or? Yes, Mark. How often do you have to restock these Florida bass? I'm sure it depends on how often they're, I mean, how quick they're caught out, but is there a, something known about that? Yeah, these, uh, these fish uh, reproduce just like a normal largemouth bass. So, you know, the question then comes up is what do you get uh, when you get uh, an, a tiger bass that reproduces with one of your native fish? You know, you get a mixture of, you get those important genetics into that offspring. The aggressiveness, the longevity, the cold tolerance, and also you get, uh, you get the longevity and the, and in with us, so you get part of what you've got. If you've got a population of pure F1s or tiger bass that you start out with, then what is this FX generation going to be? That's the the one that the the two uh, F1s spawn together, and then on down the line, when you get the second generation and third and fourth, what do you actually have in there? Uh, all of us remember when we were in school about the old bell curve that comes up. What actually happens in these is that is that about 80% of that offspring is similar to the parent, to the parent F1. And then on each side of that curve, as it drops down, you get 10% of that on each side that's more like the native or northern bass and 10% that's more like the Florida bass. And so that's typically what you see and what we've seen in, uh, in populations that are more than, that are up to 10 or more years old. So when you look at those, that's, that's what you get genetic-wise. But we haven't seen any decrease in, uh, in, in catchability or the, the good attributes of this. And, you know, this is a lot different than crossing, for instance, uh, making a hybrid sunfish, where one of the parents is not really a very desirable fish. It's a green sunfish. And, and you know, we don't stock those, but we use that in this cross because it has a larger mouth size and it has it, and it makes these offspring grow at a more rapid rate because they outcompete native the native bluegill but in in this situation where those where those cross you end up with a very high percentage of that offspring as uh, as a green sunfish this doesn't happen because both these fish are desirable and have desirable traits how many years have you guys been stocking these f1s uh, we've stocked F1s here probably for um, uh, uh, more than 15 years. Yeah. So. <clears throat> that being said, you've got some five, cr it's been crossed by five times at least by now. At least, yeah. And that particular fish that's been crossed that many times, <clears throat> what do you feel like if a, just for example, if a northern uh, strain largemouth at two years old in a reservoir here weighed two pounds, what do you feel like that, that F1 that you've crossed five times at two years old, how much of an advantage do you think, just ballpark, I won't hold you to it, but ballpark, how much weight poundage at that two-year-old do you think that fish would have? That's a very interesting question, and uh, you know, I could I could give you an answer to that based on what data we have, 
in some of the lakes that we manage, but that doesn't apply to your lakes in Tennessee. And all of you should realize that regardless of the premium genetics that you have in, for instance, a cattle, say a bull, okay, if you take the offspring of that champion bull and put it on a pasture that's already crowded with cattle, the growth rate can't be expressed because there's not enough food there for that to happen. And so that's a very important point to consider in these things. All things even, that fish that you talked about would be larger. Now how much larger I couldn't tell you because all that is based specifically on that individual reservoir and how much food that fish has to eat. So a lot of it, a lot of it's habitat and that's one of the reasons that uh, Elwise, for instance, are introduced so that they can keep that food level up so that food is not the limiting factor in growth. So all these things have to be considered. This is not a simple thing. You know, it, it looks like it is, but it's, but it's really a lot more complicated than it appears. And, you know, people don't realize how fast bass can grow. But we've had individuals of ours, F1s, who have grown four pounds in a year. How far uh, north? Have you placed F1s? How far north have you placed them? Virginia. Uh, we Let me get it right in front of this mic. Uh, Virginia is, is in southern Illinois. Uh, in both of those situations, these F1s have done extremely well. We've had a contract for about four or five years with the state of Virginia where we provided uh, F1 fingerlings to them. Uh, you know, they, they have hatcheries just like you have hatcheries here in Tennessee, but uh, it was much easier for them to purchase a two-inch fingerling from us than it was to gear up and provide space to keep their Floridas and, uh, and a selected strain of northern separate. So they purchased fish from us for, for about four years. We were providing anywhere from 50 to uh, 120,000 fingerlings a year for stockings in some specific reservoirs that they had. They didn't do a statewide thing. They looked at individual reservoirs and felt where they had the need for this, and, and they purchased them from us and stocked them. Reservoirs that they stacked, that they stocked in Virginia. They were fairly, um, I'm not going to say they were 50,000 acres, but uh, I, actually I can't remember. Uh, once you guys get as old as me, you'll understand how this is. You just can't recall some of those facts sometimes. but. Uh, between 10 and 20,000 acres. There's a concern been voiced about being cautious about growing a small fish that won't bite, back crossing or whatever the term might be. Is that, in, it seems to me there's just as much chance of growing a huge fish that will, that's very aggressive. Is that, can you identify that? I mean, can you comment on that a little bit? I mean, it, it's that's a genetic possibility, I suppose, but it's, like I mentioned earlier, you know, if you, if you breed fish that are hard to catch, you'll, you'll get fish that are hard to catch. That's the result of the genetic inheritance on that. If you put something like we have, which is uh, in our particular strain of northern bass will be much more aggressive than the native strain that you have here because that's a selected strain that we have. So anything you put out there in the wild has got that, in, that, that where you introduce an aggressiveness that comes from that fish genetically, then the offspring of those will be much more aggressive than what your native fish will be. Anybody else have any other questions? Now, by the same token, you know, this if you if you do, like if you introduce just pure Florida bass, we know those are more difficult to catch. And so you don't get that aggressive gene in there uh, when you get that back cross with your native fish. Well, thank you guys very much for uh, taking time to have us come up here and tell you a little bit about what we've got going on there. And, and we'll be looking forward to uh, maybe some questions in the future. And if we can work with you in any way, we'll certainly be glad to do that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can we ask, can I ask Bobby a, a question? Bobby, we went over some of our cost on our, uh, what it costs to stock the striped bass and the walleye and the sauger. And we know that um, the numbers that, that some of us have looked at, we're not spending 
uh, 5% of our budget on, on largemouth bass. Could we get uh, some proposals together from some several different people like these guys here um, to see what it would take to stock these, stock these Florida strain bass? The, uh, as I said earlier, <laughs> uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to meet with our biologists to, uh, to kind of go over some things that we've been waiting the results for. We got the results of the Chickamauga genetics thing that we would kind of like the last piece of the puzzle for, for that lake anyway. We just got them yesterday or the day before, so we're going to look at that and see what all that means. Uh, we have a, a geneticist from Auburn going to come in and talk to us, and and we're going to put all the pieces together, try to come up with a recommendation that we think uh, would be good for stocking Florida bass and maybe F1s in Tennessee. So I don't know if we'll we have an idea maybe of how many we want to stock, um, where we're going to how we're going to get them, whether it's our own hatchery space, or whether we're going to purchase some from somebody like American Sport Fish. Uh, we'll we'll have something better, a better idea by uh, at the next commission meeting. Is that something that we could be able to be stocking these Florida bass come April? That we'd be able to in 2015. I think we'll be able to start stocking some of the uh, recommended places that we're looking at by this year. Yeah, about 2015. Okay. Okay. All right. For the sake of time, I'm going to cut a few things out today and we can roll those to January uh, when we meet then at a two-day meeting so right now what I'd like to do we're gonna skip through wildlife and skip through retention recruitment and we're gonna go to biodiversity and at this time I'll go ahead and ask John McFadden if he'd come up and do the presentation on Tennessee tree project 